If you uh, have been with us and been awake over this time, we started way down the mountain as we talked about lament and the honesty and the pain of the silence of God. I don't know anything that bothers God's people, the real ones, more than that particular loss when you've been walking, when you've been standing, when you've been hearing, when you've been rejoicing, and then it's gone. And you wonder, is it me? Was it something I did? Did I say something to offend him? How have I failed in such a way that I'll never be used again? It's a big deal. And so that's a time when God's people are honest. You lament the sadness of it and the loss of it, and you're honest about it. If you're not honest about it, you never get any place with it. And you never hear the things that God has to say when you walk in the dark. Never doubt in the dark what God has taught you in the light. I've been a Bible teacher for very, very long. And occasionally I come across a text that doesn't seem to fit in everything else that I know about the Bible. And when I come on that kind of text, I just junk it. No, I go deeper. One time Ruth and Billy Graham were in the worshiping in a church where I was the pastor and Anna and I had lunch with them. And uh, we were in the car driving to the restaurant after the worship service that morning. And Mr. Graham brought up a question um, and I could hear a noise in the back seat And I turned around, and Ruth Graham had her big black Bible, and she was going through it. And she said, I love questions. I love questions because they send me to the Word, and I can find out what God says. So you lament it. It's hard. It hurts. It's a lonely place to be, but it's real, and it's the experience of all Christians in every place and at every time. Jesus himself on the cross knew that loss when a holy God turned his back on the son who bore our sin and the cry from the cross was, why, why have you forsaken me? That's our cry too. Why have you forsaken me? And then. We looked at establishing the memorials of God's history. Jesus, tell me a story. Let me see my story. Let me listen to your voice in the coming and the going of my life, the places where it hurts and the places where I laugh. Tell me a story. You know what's been so cool about this weekend, as short as it is? is so many of you have told me your stories. And as you told me your story, I heard the voice of Jesus because that's where we hear it, in our own story and in the story of God's people when they they tell it. Jesus, tell me a story. And then this evening, we're going to talk about claiming the promises of God, and it's not going to be what you think it is. Someday I'm going to do a series on the promises of God if I can just find out which are and which aren't the promises of God. I've gotten a dozen questions from you guys about the subject of promises. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that this evening. I'm more interested in the one who makes the promises. But in the dark, to say to the God of the universe, but you promised and I'm trusting you, you promised is a powerful and wonderful thing. I can't tell you how many times in the dark I've said that. You promised that you would never leave me. And it feels like you have, but I claim your promise. You promised to always love me even when I'm unlovable. And I've been very unlovable and it feels like you left but I'm claiming the promise and I'm holding on to it in the dark because it's all I've got. 
Sometimes I feel so guilty, I blush at what I've done. The people I've hurt, the things that are so offensive to your holiness, and I think I can never be forgiven because I've come with this so often. But you promised, and I'm forgiven. In the dark, when you can't hear God, you got to lean on him hard. I heard a missionary say one time that they were going through a very large, long missionary meeting. That's the only thing I don't like about missionaries. They don't know when to go home. (laughs) They don't know when to stop. That's true of ministries, too. I served for years, 20 years, on the ministry of Harvest USA in Philadelphia. I was on the board there for years. That's a ministry, started as a ministry to the gay and lesbian community. And half the board members were... Uh, uh, either former or present lesbian celibate, lesbian or gay, and almost all of the staff. And I said, Lord, are you sure you want me to serve there? You know what they're going to say about me. And his answer was profound. It was in Hebrew, so. (laughs) So... (laughs) But I hate it. I hate it all. If I get to heaven and Jesus calls a meeting, I'm in the other place. Uh, meetings just go on forever. And we had a board meeting one night, and they decided to let the entire staff give their testimonies. And they were wonderful testimonies at nine. At 10, they were a little bit less so. <laughs> By 11 o'clock, I was just drifting off, and I decided I have to leave. And so I went back to my, I slipped out the back and went back to the hotel room and I felt so guilty and I said, Jesus, I'm so sorry. And he said, I don't know why I left at 10. (laughs) (laughs) The promise of God, even in the dark. But anyway, I heard a missionary and a long missionary who was suffering from probably the flu and she was feeling faint. And she heard a voice from behind her say, lean back. And she did, and she felt somebody's knees. Lean on me, the voice said. And so she leaned a little bit heavier. And then the voice said, lean harder. That's what God says to his people in his promises. We'll say a little bit about the promises and some that aren't and some that are. But that's what it's all about in the dark when you can't hear God's voice. You remember, he says, lean on me hard. Lean on me. So let's pray. Father, we come before you asking that you would take your word, put it in our minds and then in our hearts and our vocal cords. Father, it would be nice if you spoke. We don't get a vote, but you're still faithful. You still love us. You still care. And your promises are still true. As always, we pray for the one who teaches. Forgive him his sins, because there are many. We would see Jesus and him only. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There are a number of lists of God's promises, and there have been books and books, some good, not so good, written about the promises of God. Somebody gave me a list of a distillation of the promises of God. God promises to be with you, to protect you, will be your strength, will answer you, will provide for you, will give you peace, and will always love you. Well, maybe. Maybe. Maybe not. I talked to a man this afternoon who told me his story. Seven years, he lost everything. And the God who was the provider, who some had said, he promised you're going to be successful. Turned out he wasn't successful. And he told me this afternoon about the American gospel that says God will continue to bless you and you will be successful. And he said, I wasn't. And the tears welled up in his eyes as he talked about it. 
I look over those promises and I know that God will protect me, but I've had friends who've been murdered. I know that God will protect me, but I've seen the missionaries who have been tortured and killed. I know that God will protect me, but you ought to see some of the letters that I get from people who are angry at me. I know that God, but you got to be very, very careful. So there are expositions on that. Personally, I believe that all the promises of God can be distilled into three. He'll always love you, he'll never leave you, and you'll be in trouble. <laughs> he'll always love you, he'll never leave you, and you'll always be in trouble. Let me read to you a text my friend Lee Clower sent. Lee Clower is a man's man, lives in Chattanooga, and we've been friends for 35 years. And incidentally, he spells his name Lee the way a girl would spell his name, so he has to be very secure. And he is. He's big, and he's a former fighter pilot, and he can be very mean. But he stood with me in hard times sometimes uh, when I resigned uh, from the church. That was a hard year of loneliness and pain. I had to sever relationships of many years. I couldn't reinstitute or minister in the way that I had for the past 30 years, it was a hard time, and I was close to a nervous breakdown. Nobody knew it. If you've got a deep voice like mine, and you can say things without crying, people think you're really together, and I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And I want to say, don't, because I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> you can't follow me. And I was having a breakdown, and it was hard, and it was awful. And Lee Clower came alongside. I told him I was gonna, I was gonna wake up the dogs in my life and find out why I'm so driven. I was traveling 160, 170 days a year, writing a book a year, turning out five broadcasts a week, trying to be a good father and a good husband, trying to be a good pastor and visit the hospitals and counsel the people who had broken hearts, and the system broke down. And I had to find out why I was driven so much. And so I called Lee because he was my friend and he had walked with me. And I said, uh, I said Lee, uh, I'm going to wake up some sleeping dogs, and it's pretty scary, so you pray for me. And he said, I will. And I was speaking in Chattanooga shortly after that. And I was talking to a number of people and he was at this conference and he elbowed his way through the crowd. And he said, Steve, I got to run, but I got a message that God told me to give you. And I said, really, what did he say? And he said, God said, wake up the dogs. They don't have any teeth. <laughs> and he promised. That's the promises of God. Listen to what he did. And this was just last week. He texted this to me. Steve, Jesus will love you, redeem you, give you eternal life, forgive all your sins, never leave you, sanctify you, and be your friend. On the other hand, all I can promise is that I'll love you and I will be your friend. <laughs> Somebody has said a real friend will forgive you if you kill somebody, but a really, really good friend will help you bury the body. And I want you to know that Lee Cow, we're going to be talking about the friendship of God and the promises of the friend who makes those promises. Let me read just a couple of texts, and I could have gone to a hundred different texts. In Joshua 23, Joshua's coming to the end of his life, and he knows that it's over for him. And he gives a, a swan song speech. And among that, this is what he says. And this is verse 14. And now I'm about to go the way of the, all, of the earth. And you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you, and not one of them has failed. 
And then in 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, and in verses 19 through 21, there's a wonderful, wonderful statement about Jesus and the promises of God. Listen to this. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. This is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. All the promises of God find their yes in Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to talk about that in just a minute, or at least we're going to talk about the promisor more than the promises. But before we do that, I want to go down one side road, and I want to say this, that everything you've heard from the pulpit about God's promises are sometimes not what he promised. Do you know in Star Trek when uh, Spock uh, was being interviewed for something he had done, they had a computer that analyzed the voice and said whether what was witnessed was true or untrue. And the computer would listen to the testimony and the computer would say, untrue or true, untrue. We ought to have computers like that in the church. Because as my friend said this afternoon, the American gospel says that you are to be successful and God will honor everything you do and your investments will grow so much that you'll become an Episcopalian. <laughs> untrue. You want to have a, to face cancer or Parkinson's or MS because God has promised to heal you, untrue. Let me tell you something, we interviewed, and she, she was a light, delight, she lives in Utah, I think, and uh, her name is, uh, I just say I gotta check, you know, I'm an old guy doing the best I can, okay. Um, Rachel Joy Welcher, and she wrote a book and the title was Talking Back to the Purity Culture. We need to do that sometimes because we have a culture in the church that is divine earthly blessing and divine earthly retribution. Do bad, bad things are going to happen to you. Do good and you'll be blessed. Untrue. You know what happened to her? Do you remember the purity culture that they had those rings that they, the purity rings they wore? And you took pledges to not even date, to, uh, to not even kiss somebody until you were engaged, to be a virgin until marriage, all, I guess, good things. She said, I was promised that if I did that, that God would honor my marriage and I would have a home life that would be a witness to God for all the world. You know what happened to her? She did every bit of it, and her husband, after five years, left the Christian faith. And because he didn't want to be a Christian and to live with a Christian, he left her and would have nothing to do with her anymore. And she cried out to God, but you promised. And God said, no. I didn't promise. So you've got to be careful. You go to the Proverbs. Train up a child in the way uh, he should go, and he'll walk in it. That's a promise, and my kid's not there. You lied to me. No, I didn't promise that. That's a principle. We give our kids a compass, and that's what Proverbs is talking about, and they hate it, but they can't get rid of it. Fred Smith used to teach that. We give our kids a compass and they want to rip it out and throw it away and get rid of it. 
but they never will, and they'll never cha- they'll never get rid of it, and it always points home, always. But that's all you can do. Sometimes they don't come home. Sometimes the principle doesn't work the way it's supposed to be. And when you say, my kid is an atheist, and you promised, and God said, no, I didn't promise. There's this thing about freedom and responsibility and intentionality and decisions, and your kid is not a computer that you program with the promises of God and can count on everything working out exactly the way you want it to work out. So you, you got to be careful. A number of years ago, I was asked by the, one of the local colleges, a uh, public college, by the way, in Miami, if I would give a two-part lecture on the theology of the Apostle Paul. It was a religion class, and the lady who was the professor in that religion class was a Christian, and she knew that I was, sort of, and so she invited me to come and lecture on Pauline theology. I remember some of the questions that I received during that lecture. Jesus loved women, but Paul, uh, uh, Paul hated them. And then I pointed out that maybe it was the other way around. Since Jesus didn't have any women disciples, and the apostle Paul did, but we had a good time, and there was a lot of <laughs> questions and a lot of coming. But let me tell you the most important thing about that day. This professor had a little boy who had juvenile diabetes. And she had gotten with some Christians who felt that God had told them to tell her as an act of faith if she would remove the insulin upon which he needed to live, if she would remove the insulin, that he would be healed. And so after I finished the lecture, she said, could I talk to you? And she started crying. And I said, yes, let's go somewhere. And she told me what I just told you. And I said, first, it is no accident that I'm here today. You've been listening to people who don't know what they're talking about and have said some really stupid things to you And I do know what I'm talking about, so read my lips. That's a lie. And it's from the pit of hell, and it smells like smoke. You see where they put her? If she didn't remove uh, the insulin, her boy would remain with juvenile diabetes, and in those days they died young, and it would be her fault. If she did remove the insulin and what they had said didn't work and her son died, it would be her fault. They told her about the promise of God and they lied about the promise of God. As a matter of fact, God is faithful. He's good all the time. And he does make promises and you can rely on them but be careful the promises that you claim. I've gotten a dozen questions today from you guys about the idea of promises. One dear lady said to me, can I claim the promises of the Bible when they are made to somebody else for myself? And I said, with great profound insight, well, yes and no. (laughs) The promises made to everybody in the Bible reflect the personality and the reality and the attributes and the MO of the God of the universe. And you can lean on that and you can trust that he will always act within the context of what was promised to somebody else. But to make that specific, somebody else said, look, I... uh, When God speaks to me and promises something, I lean on it. And I say, that's good, because God sometimes does that. He'll promise you something in your prayer life, and it'll be really clear, but you got to be careful. Because it may be him, but it may be indigestion. So you have to be careful about leaning on it too hard. When you see promises in the Bible that uh, that are made to a theocracy, to Israel, 
and you claim them from America, does God operate in that way? Oh, yes. But don't make it absolute and don't put God's feet to the fire because he won't have it. Bottom line is that he'll be your friend and he'll be faithful and he'll be there and you'll be in trouble. A number of years ago, I got a letter uh, from a teenager uh, in California and she said, Mr. Brown, you don't know me, but I was wondering if you would be my friend. And she said, I know you're busy, and if you can't be your friend, I will, un- my friend, I will understand. But even if you don't want to be my friend, I will be your friend. I wrote her back, and we corresponded over 15 years. I watched her go through high school and college. I listened to her confessions and listened to her tears, and we were friends Even if you don't want me to be your friend, I will still be your friend. Jerry Falwell said that one time too. It was in Miami and he had been invited to come there and speak to all of the the rabbis in the American Rabbinic Association from all over America. And they picketed him outside the Fontainebleau Hotel And uh, my dear friend, the head of the American Jewish Committee, thought that he ought to invite his Goyim friend. That would be me, because it would be Faldwell and me, the only Gentiles in the meeting. And the body language. By the way, during that time, I was playing with my Christian ring, and it fell off my finger and rolled three rows back. (laughs) And it was when it had a cross on it. And I decided I better go get it. I went and get it, and the rabbi gave it to me. And I said, thank you very much. And I went back and sat down, and I said, Lord, it's me and Jerry, and that's all that's here, so please bless him when he speaks. And he did. He spoke well. At the end, he had a question and an answer period, and during the question and the answer period, one of the rabbis stood up and said, Dr. Faldwell, what do you want from me? And he said, I don't want anything from you. I've got everything I want. I'm not here to get anything about from you. I've come to say that I'm going to be your friend. And even if you don't want me to be your friend, I'm still going to be your friend. He said, I'm going to hear, I'm here to say I love you. And even if that irritates you and you don't want me to love you, I'm still going to love you. When he said that, the body language changed and the applause began and Dr. Jerry Falwell got a standing ovation from the Rabbinical Association of America and it was a grand time. But I've thought about what he said a lot. It's not so much the delineation of the promises. They're there. He will love you whether he speaks or not, or whether you feel it, or whether you are lovable or unlovable, you're forgiven. And you say, but Steve, you don't know what I, you're forgiven. That's a promise. He'll never leave you. He'll never say, I've had it with you. He'll never leave you in the dark without his being present. Uh, And that is a promise. And you will get into trouble. But the issue isn't so much the promises and an exegesis of the promises in Scripture, but rather the nature of the one who makes the promise. And so when God isn't speaking, there's some things that you need to remember about him. First, when somebody makes a promise, you need to be assured that that person is trustworthy. And trustworthiness is the middle name of the God of the universe. I've been doing this for a whole lot of years, and God has never lied to me. He's never, he has uh, never let me down. He's never left me, even when I felt that he did, and he knew all of my secrets that I can't even tell to you, and he still hugs me. In fact, he loves me 10% more than he loves you. 
And if you can't say back to me, he loves me 10% more than he loves you, then you haven't understood. Some of you know Charlie Morgan uh, from the old Key Biscayne Church, and you probably knew his mother, uh, Corabel Morgan. Corabel died about four or five years ago, and I was talking to Charlie, and he was talking about being at the wake before the funeral, and there were a lot of people there because she touched a lot of lives in Miami. And uh, Debbie Petersons, by the way, was really close to Corabel, who was Lee's close friend. Uh, and Charlie said it was really funny. He said, a lady came up to me, a lady that was my mother's age, and said, I'm, I'm really going to miss your mother. And let me tell you something. We were best friends. We studied the Bible and we prayed together, and I'm really going to miss her. <laughs> Charlie said he thought that was really nice until two minutes later, another woman came up <laughs> and said, uh, I'm going to miss your mother. You probably don't know this, but we were best friends. <laughs> we prayed together. He said nine people came to him and said exactly the same thing about Corabel. Well, billions of Christians can come before the world and say, Jesus loves me. This I know 10% more than he loves you. What about him? What about his nature? Is he trustworthy? George Bingham came into my office when I was working on this material last week. And I looked up at him and he comes in. He's the president. It's Dr. George Bingham. He has a PhD, and he's the president of Key Life and one of the wisest people I've ever known. I've known George for 40 years. I married he and his wife. I buried their baby. I walked through the dark times and the painful times, and, and we love each other. In fact, it was really hard for an old guy. What we're planning at Key Life is DD Day, and that's the day Steve drools or dies. And so as a core, as a board, we've tried to prepare things by creating more voices of key life and others that are involved and young people. And we're doing that, and we're seeing some really exciting things happening. And I looked at George when I was working on this, and I said, George, you remind me of Jesus. He said, no, I don't. I said, yes, you do. And i tell you what I'm going to tell the people at the Cove, that I trust you with my life. I do. It's hard to turn your ministry. I've been the president of Key Life for 30 years. I made all the decisions. I fired the people that needed to be fired, hired the people that needed to be hired, and did what was necessary and made the decisions. And all of a sudden, I have to give it to somebody else and I wouldn't have done it for anybody else but George Bingham. Sometimes I say to Jesus, I wouldn't do this for anybody else but you because you've demonstrated your trustworthiness in my life every step of the way. And so when it's dark and I can't hear your voice, I know that your love is exactly the same. When I've done bad things and I feel awful about it and guilty and blush, I know, even if you don't speak to me, that you've forgiven me and you forgave me before I even confessed it. My African-American friend Jerry Perry's in Orlando, and I love that brother more than I can tell you, and he gets grace, and we've done two or three grace conferences together that were been that were kind of sideways, a race conference doing our best. Because we all know we're sinners and we all know we repent and we all know that we're loved. And this is what Jerry Perry says, and you can remember it. You will run out of sin before God runs out of grace. That's a promise. And even when I don't forgive it, I don't believe it. And he's not speaking and it's dark in my mind. I know he's trustworthy and he has promised. But that's not enough, is it? 
There has to be more than that. I've got trustworthy friends who want to help me, but don't know how. I've got trustworthy friends who want to give me financial gifts for Key Life, but they don't have any money. I have friends who really want to hold up my arms, but they're too tired and they can't hold up their arms. And so the second requirement is not only trustworthiness, but resource. Resource. It's very important when you're walking in the dark that you remember who God is. You remember the book of Job, when Job had had it? A lot of silly things are said about the book of Job, how wonderful and pure and godly he was. And he said, if you slay me, I will trust you. Well, he said that, but it went south after that. That was the last spiritual thing that he said. After that, he was complaining and kicking against the goats and telling God exactly what he thought. And by the way, Satan came in and Jesus and God said, have you seen my servant Job? You know where I want to live? I want to sin just enough so I'll be on the side so God never says to Satan. <laughs> Listen, it's all right. Jesus has forgiven me. So that God never says to Satan, have you seen my servant Steve? I want to be under the radar and I want to sin at least twice a day to make sure that that kind of thing doesn't happen. And then Job says, I've had it with you and I'm going to question you, he says to God. And God says, no, you have it wrong. I will question you. And at the 38th chapter began a series like, where were you when I created the world? One question after another, after another, at the end of which Job said, oops. <laughs> Sorry about that. I spoke without thinking. Say, God, show me what you showed Job. Remind me of a creation that you made. Let me see your power and your glory and your strength. Let me see you in such ways that I am awed by your greatness and your power and who you are. Listen, it's not enough that God is trustworthy and he is. He's powerful, he's big, and he's strong. And he can, I was on uh, the Bob Bell program last week in Knoxville. I love Bob Bell uh, at the Christian Radio. He does a morning show and he's a nut and I am too. And so we have fun every time I go on and, and we talk. And I didn't realize that last year Bob Bell had a coronary. And I had a coronary five years before, which will wake you up, I'll tell you. I mean, it, when I went to the hospital, I, I may have told you this, I went into the outpatient, and this attendant in the outpatient department jumped up and said, Steve Brown, I can't believe this. And I said, Lord, don't do this to me. I'm going to cuss and spit, and I'm not going to be a good witness for you. Please give me a pagan. Don't give me a Christian. <laughs> I'm dying here. And people die in hospitals. And I'll tell you, though, if you want to be moved in fast from the outpatient waiting room, grab your heart and say it hurts. And boy, they'll move you fast into the back. And they did me. And before I went in there, she went up and she just hugged me, this little girl. And she whispered in my ear, it's from Jesus, Steve. It will be okay. Uh, so Bob Bell and I were talking about our heart attacks. Old people talk about physical things <laughs> and restaurants. I mean, it's the main subject of our conversation. And so, and so uh, he and I started talking about the prospect of death, and that brought up heaven. And then we started talking about heaven. And I said, you know the best thing about heaven? He said, no, what? I said, I'm going to have hair in heaven. That's what's the best thing about hair. When you talk about restoration, that's where I'm going to be restored. And he said, Steve, you're kidding. And I said, well, sort of. But I've asked him a lot to do that. 
And uh, it would be nice to have a full head of hair again. And if God wants me to have a full head of hair, I will. I've told you before about C.S. Lewis and the Chronicles of Narnia and the children that go into the imaginary kingdom. And you know about the lion, the lion of Judah, not safe, but good. Well, the first time Jill goes into the Narnia, she's, you know, they go and they're gone for a long time. And when they return to their own world, they've only been gone a short time. And Jill is in Narnia and she's really thirsty. And she, and she noticed that there's a crystal stream of cold water right over there. And then she noticed that there is a line between where she is and the water. And she says to the lion, uh, would you move while I go over there and get a drink of water? And the lion says, no. And she said, uh, do you eat little girls? <laughs> and the lion says, yes, and little boys and men and women and worlds and universes. And she said, I'm going to go to another stream. <laughs> And the lion says, there is no other stream. And she stamps her foot and she said, then I'll be thirsty. And the lion says, then be thirsty. That's God. A God so awesome that you can't even. In fact, I believe that sometimes when he doesn't speak to us, it's because it's almost impossible for an infinite God to speak to a finite human being. John Calvin said that the Bible was God's baby talk. And in order for an infinite God to speak to us, our pea brains, in something we can understand, it's got to be sort of like, hey, cutie, love you. It's sort of like that's the God of the universe. And once you see his greatness, you not only see his promises and his trustworthiness, but his power to deliver on everything, even when you can't hear his voice. And there's one other thing, and then we're finished. Not only you got to know his trustworthiness and his resources, You've got to know his attitude about you. The message of the Bible is his love. For God so loved the world. For God so loved Steve. For God so loved Annie. For God so loved Bill and Chip that he gave his only begotten son. You got to know the attitude. We, I have a former student who, uh, Jim Cofield, was the head of our counseling department at Reformed Theological Seminary, where I've taught for many years. And Jim is a wonder. He lives in Tennessee now. And my friend, who's a pastor and who's now uh, is a former student, uh, went through some really rough times and. Jim and his wife, Mona, invited him to come and live with them during the summer. And he thought that was so cool until he got to thinking about it. And he thought, you know, I don't know if I want to live with a seminary professor. What if I have a beer and he finds out? What if I cuss inadvertently and he hears me? Or what if I do something worse than that and he has to kick me out and then I have to sit in his class? And so Jim waited for his answer for a long time. And finally, Jim called him up and he said, are you going to accept my offer or not? He said, I I don't know, frankly. What if I do something bad and you have to kick me out? That'd be awful for you, and that would be awful for me too. And then Jim said something that changed my friend's life. He said, Bill, I made up my mind about you a long time ago. God made up his mind about you a long time ago. He's for you. 
Somebody asked me today my testimony. When did you become a Christian? And I think they asked it because they weren't sure I was. <laughs> and they wanted a date on it and some details. And I said about 2,000 years ago, in fact, a million years ago, before God hung the stars and hollowed out the valleys and put the world to spin, he remembered me. He remembered you and he loved you. And because he made up his mind about you so long ago, you can trust him, the promiser of promises in your life. We have two daughters and uh, Robin and Jennifer, and they were a delight. I'm sorry for you guys that have sons. <laughs> I'll pray for you, that's got to be very hard, but daughters, that's one of the reasons I know Jesus likes me. And then he confirmed it by giving me three granddaughters, not a single gorilla in the bunch. <laughs> when they were little girls, we were living in New England in the Boston area. And, uh, we were living in a church manse right next to First Presbyterian Church on the South Shore in Quincy, and, uh, and we love New England, and we still do some of our fondest memories. But one of the things you ought to know about New England is those picturesque rock walls that are all over New England, those rocks came out of the fields, and people busted their posteriors to make those walls so they could, they could clean out the fields and grow the props. Well, we had a backyard and it had a lot of rocks in it. And every time I tried to mow it, they got stuck in the mower and it was just awful. So I made a deal with Robin and Jennifer. I said, girls, if you will go out and pick rocks out of that backyard, I'll give you a nickel for every rock that you, that you can pick up. And they said, way cool. And they made it out to the backyard. And to my horror, I looked and the pile of rocks was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to go bankrupt. I can't pay this kind of money. This is going to be big bucks. And so I said to him, girls, could we renegotiate the price on these rocks? <laughs> and they said in unison, daddy, you promised. And they got paid. Every dime. If you listen to what I taught you this evening, you can say that to your heavenly father. When it's dark, when you can't hear his voice, when what the doctor said isn't very pleasant, when you've lost a loved one, when you don't know if you can make the mortgage, uh, when you lost your job, when God seems to have gone away very quietly, but on the basis of God's word, you can say, Daddy, you promised. You think about that. Amen.